thank you, Micah and band, giving me a pickup today. I went to sleep uh, uh, depressed last night that the ducks couldn't hold on to their lead. <laughs> so when we see five terrorist attacks in London this year, nukes being launched from North Korea, white supremacists in Charlottesville, Antifa in Berkeley and other cities, murders in Chicago, looters in Houston and Florida when people abandon their homes. We wonder what can one person like me to turn, do to turn things around in the world? Uh, is there anything I can do to help this sin-sick world? If you're discouraged with the direction our world is going and feel like there's nothing you can do about it, listen to what Jesus says about the amazing influence we have. Let's stand in honor of God's word. Why don't you read this with me? You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Lord Jesus, we get discouraged at times thinking uh, the world seems out of control and we don't think we can do anything to change that. But you tell us we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Uh, tell us uh, what that means today. Help us understand it and encourage us with that. We're ready to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You might wonder what possible difference can Christ followers make in a world that appears to be going off the rails. Uh, in the verses just before what we just read, Jesus says what uh, uh, characteristics sh should typify Christ's followers. And you may be thinking, what possible influence can the poor in spirit, the humble, uh, the merciful, uh, the pure in heart have? What can they accomplish? Uh, Jesus does not share our skepticism. He says to us, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Jesus says Christ's followers are the most influential people in the world. What does Jesus mean when he says you're the salt of the earth and the light of the world? What's the function of salt and light? I'd like your, I'd like your help. So everybody from... Uh, this side over on my left, I want you to think about what is what are what are the functions of salt? And no, 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 just you're going to think about it. And uh, everybody over here uh, is going to think about what are the functions of light. And I'd like you to uh, huddle up with one to three other people and just talk about it. I'll give you about a minute. Go. And look for people that have made, you know, don't leave anybody out. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so uh, let's start with uh, this side. What are, what are the functions of salt? And now you can shout it out. Flavor and, and life. Flavor, life. Preservative. Preservative. Yeah. All right. So when I th think about what Jesus had, to, had in mind, uh, I think in his time there were two primary uses. It was a condiment and a preservative. As a condiment, it's spicy. So if someone today says something snide or, or critical or sarcastic, you say, that was salty. As a condiment, it 
brings out flavor in food. It makes people thirsty. Uh, Jesus means that we're to add spice to the world and make people thirsty for God. Uh, when I met Jory in Chicago, she was a first-year teacher at an elementary school. Her husband had just died of cancer. And everybody at the school knew that she was a Christian. And so they watched this 22-year-old widow and saw her perseverance coming back uh, to work sooner than anybody expected and her, her peace, her, her winsomeness, and it made them thirsty for Christ. But an even more important function of salt in Jesus' time was that of a preservative. Uh, Middle Easterners in that time did not have uh, deep freezers. Uh, when they uh, wanted to preserve their meats and other types of foods, they put it in salt. Uh, when Jewish people thought of salt, they thought of that uh, precious commodity that prevented meats and other foods from going bad. Jesus', Jesus inference is that as salt, we are to act as a preservative in a world that is evil and prone to decay. Your presence at school or work should cause a change in the language used, the, the jokes shared, or the gossip spinning. Uh, Peter Marshall was an Elkin speaker and was uh, for a time the uh, chaplain of the Senate and he used to tell the story of the keeper of the spring. He lived high up in the Alps above uh, a, a hamlet uh, and uh, uh, the town council of this village hired him to uh, clear away the, the debris, the leaves and branches and silt from the creeks that fed into the spring that came through their town. This forest dweller regularly and silently did his work and it kept the, the, the springs crystal clear and swans came to, to, to live there and tourists, it became an attractive tourist spot. Mill wheels uh, uh, went around in the businesses in that area and the farmlands were irrigated. Well, one night the town council got together for their semi-annual meeting and one person noticed the salary for this keeper of the springs. They said, who's he? Why do we have him on our, uh, uh, why, why do we pay him? Uh, we, we've never, we never see him. How do we know he's doing anything? And so they unanimously voted to dispense with his services. Nothing changed for a few weeks and then one day people noticed some uh, kind of a yellowish tint in the water. A few days later, it was dark brown. Uh, and then uh, uh, the mill wheels started to grind slower, and eventually some of them stopped. The swans left, the tourists left. Disease uh, creeped into, deeply into their village. Well, the town council hurriedly got together and realized with embarrassment their gross error in judgment and they hired back the keeper of the springs. And then he began to remove the leaves that had fallen and the branches and the silt. And once again, the town came back to life. What the keeper of the spring meant to the village, Christ followers mean to the world. The presence of Christ in Christians in a society should restrain it from political, social, and moral decay. Let's not kid ourselves. The fact that we don't adopt the values of the world gives us influence. You and I are to be the salt of the earth, but Jesus lays down a condition we must meet to maintain our function as salt. We must be pure. Jesus says if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot. Table salt... Sodium chloride is a very stable compound. It can't be changed, but it can be contaminated. It might be that Jesus had, uh, had in mind the, the salt that lined the outdoor ovens. After a while, the salt would become contaminated and they would take it and throw it out on the street. Just as salt can become contaminated, we can become contaminated by the values of the world and lose our ability to act as a preservative. Uh, Christian influence is dependent on our being different from the rest of society. So Jesus gives us a second affirmation. You are the light of the world. 
All right, over here, what are the functions of light? Shout it out. Okay, prevents darkness. Helps us see. Reveals so we can see. Okay, I think that's primarily, I think, what Jesus had in mind, that we are the, we provide light to guide people in this world. I mean, one of the greatest features of our cell phones is the um, flashlight function. I can't think of how many times I've been rescued from darkness by my cell phone. I think that's what Jesus has in mind. You are the light of the world. You're to guide people uh, in dark paths so they can see where they're going. As light we are to shine. Uh, Jesus says, without you the world is in darkness. You guide people by your lives and your words to see the true life that only God gives. In 2004, it's doubtful that anybody had a greater impact for the kingdom of God than Mel Gibson. That was the year he produced The Passion of the Christ. That movie was uh, seen in theaters by millions of Americans. And then it went into massive DVD sales. And then it, it broke all records in international sales. Um, even places like Denmark, which is notoriously anti-Christian, uh, Christians there said it was amazing how that movie gave them opportunity to talk to their friends. So how did it come about for Mel Gibson to produce that movie? Uh, by his own admission, he was not a faithful follower of Christ. Uh, Christ was very low priority in his life. His life was all about making movies and money and fame and... Uh, he was, a, as he, he called himself, a low-impact low follower of Christ. And then he came into a, a season of life when he was disillusioned with all the fame and money. And, um, and so he began to read his Bible. He began to, to pray. And uh, uh, during that time, he committed his life to Christ. He said, Christ, I want what you want for me. And at that point, he felt like Christ prompted him, I want you to make a new kind of movie. And he launched this project. It took him 12 years to research, write, shoot, and edit The Passion of the Christ. And he says those were very difficult years for him because many friends just dropped him. People said, you're an idiot. You do that and you'll never get another role in Hollywood. Not an investor will touch it. This is suicide for your career. But he persevered and produced the movie and he shined a light on Jesus Christ in the world. Jesus also lays down a condition we must fulfill if we are to function as light. I want you to read this with me. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The condition to be an effective influence is we must be visible. Jesus says it's contradictory to have the light and then hide it. It's ridiculous to light a lamp and then cover it. Yet that's... What often happens today? Uh, the misinterpretation about the separation of church and state in our courts has left many Christians thinking that we should just keep our heads down and our mouths shut about our faith. Jesus says we must let the truth about Jesus Christ be known through our deeds and words so that people ask, what makes you different? Jesus says Christ followers are the most influential people in the world. We are the preservative from moral corruption and the light that guides people. We can make a huge difference in the world. So I'd like to make four theological reflections about our influence in the world. First, influential Christ followers are different. It's true that some non-believers uh, adopt a veneer of Christian culture. And some Christians seem indistinguishable from the world by their non-Christian behavior. But Jesus wants us to make no mistake 
that Christ followers are fundamentally different. He says, the world is like decaying fish. You are salt. The world is in darkness. You are light. Apostle Paul says the same thing in Ephesians 1. Listen to the way he addresses the Ephesians. To God's people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, he chose us to be holy and blameless. He tells them that they're faithful, holy, and blameless. He starts with who we are before he talks about what we're to do. Now, that's the opposite of religion. God doesn't work like that. God starts with an act of faith in which we join ourselves to Jesus Christ. We admit that we're poor in spirit and that we need Christ. We commit our lives to him. He comes in and makes us a new creature. We're a brand new person. Our identity then shapes how we live. Paul call, doesn't call the Ephesians sinners saved by grace. He could have. That would have been true. But here's the problem. If you go around thinking of yourself as a sinner saved by grace, then it becomes likely that you'll see yourself primarily as a sinner. And secondly, saved by grace. Paul called the Ephesians, the Christians, holy people. And he wrote to regular people like us. He wasn't writing to statues of dead saints. He wasn't writing to Mother Teresa who spent her life in the slums of Calcutta. He wasn't writing to people who had done a certain number of miracles. He was writing to people like us, little kids, teenagers, young singles, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. He's writing to anyone who put their faith in Christ and calls us faithful saints. We need to get this straight before we go any further because it means I'm a miracle and you're a miracle. My life and destiny have changed and so has yours. We're not sinners, we're saints. We don't get to be holy because we want to be holy. We get to be holy because we've joined ourselves to Christ and he gives us his holiness. We're born again, brand new people. We aren't primarily sinners at our core. We're saints. We're salt and light. You have to grasp this radical idea with all you've got. There's always a tendency for Christians to conform to the culture. Jesus says, don't try to be the same. You are different. I, I believe that since we want people to experience our salt and light, and since most people in the world realize that the world is not working, and they want help and hope, there will be a steady stream of searchers and people invited by us into our church. Second, influential Christ followers are difference makers. God intends for you and me to penetrate our culture. Christian salt has no place remaining smugly in elegant little ecclesiastical salt shakers. Our place is to be rubbed into the culture. When things go bad in our world, uh, too often we as Christians wag our fingers and shake our heads at the godless culture. But should we not reproach ourselves? I mean, one can hardly blame unsalted meat for going bad. What else can it do? The question to ask is, where's the salt? We should not be surprised to see people stumbling around in our world in darkness. The question is, where's the light? When we're acting like salt and light, we will make a difference. Gary Haugen is the president of International Justice Mission. It's basically a consortium of lawyers. And they represent people facing injustice around the world. People that can't afford representation. And Haugen says there's so much injustice in the world. There are 46 million slaves in the world. 
When we talk about slavery in the United States, we, 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 we tend to think of it as a past tense thing, a blot in our history. But Hogan says there are more slaves in the world today than at any point in history. They work in basements of brick buildings and fishing boats and the sex trafficking industry. And Hogan says most Christian leaders today play defense. He says we need to switch from defense to offense. In 2006, Cambodia was the sex trafficking capital of the world. And international justice missions decided to go on offense. It wasn't easy. Sex trafficking industry does not want to give up their lucrative business. And so that was dangerous. But I was so pleased to see this year on the cover of Christianity Today, the, uh, the uh, lead article, Cambodia Rising. International Justice Mission decided to move from defense to offense. Third, influential Christ followers are balanced. Jesus didn't just say we're the salt of the earth. He didn't just say we're the light of the world. He said you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. This is the perfect combination of social action and evangelism. Of service to the community and sharing Christ. This requires, uh, uh, as salt, we are to preserve decay in our society. This means we're to be involved in the social, political, and moral problems of our day. As light, we are to guide people to Jesus Christ. Tell them about his love for them. Our call to be salt and light reminds us that we don't just meet human needs, we also share Christ. We don't just tell people about Jesus, we also meet human needs. We're called to be salt and light. We serve at McKay Elementary School across the street. Edgewood, just down the street, retirement home. We're starting Wednesdays. Since Beaverton schools are getting out at 1.30 every Wednesday, we're offering an after uh, school program for, for children that need, need a place to go. We're just sticking our toe in the water. We're just going to do six of them this year, about one a month. And then we try to meet the needs of uh, people in financial need. But we also share the truth about Christ. Um, we don't have it all figured out. We're trying to do a good job of serving our community. But I know there's a lot more we can do. We're trying to share the truth about Christ. But there are many more people in Portland we can reach. J.P. Guilford is, is kind of known as the father of modern creativity. His story is, is pretty interesting. He was uh, tapped by the military to select bomber pilots in World War II. And uh, so he um, did personality tests, he did intelligence tests, and he did interviews. He was paired with a retired Air Force pilot. And that irritated Guilford. He didn't know what he could offer and uh, he didn't need his help. But as they evaluated their work, months later, they found that Guilford's pilots were being shot down at a much higher rate. And he says during that time, he felt so depressed that he had, you know, hired people that, you know, went to their death uh, that he, 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 he contemplated suicide. But he didn't do that. Instead, he got up dusted himself off and decided to figure out what was going wrong. And so he asked the uh, Air Force pilot how he interviewed people. He said, I always ask, what would you do if a, uh, you flew over Germany and you were shot at by a uh, German anti-aircraft? Ones that answered I'd fly higher, he ruled out immediately. But the ones that answered him, I don't know, Maybe I'd zig and zag, maybe I'd dive, maybe I'd roll the plane. Those are the ones he hired. You see, the ones that said they'd fly higher, that was a textbook answer. And the Germans knew the textbook, the manual. They would, they would lie in wait above the clouds and shoot down pilots that flew up. 
He ruled out the ones that gave all the textbook answers. He chose the ones that were creative and said, I don't know, I'll do whatever it takes to figure it out. We need everyone in this church thinking creatively of how we can better, best serve our community. And everyone thinking together, how can we reach more people with the truth about Christ? You know, there are so many things that are bad happening in our world. It's easy for us to get discouraged and feel hopeless. To encourage us in our role as salt and light, we need people around us to build us up. Research shows over and over again that the change process happens best and most successfully with the help of other people. From other people, we get support, connection, friendship, uh, accountability, discipline, forgiveness, models, mentors. So this year I'm encouraging every one of us to get involved in a community group. Uh, Tom Raynor is a church consultant and uh, this, this year he wrote a book called I Will and in it he tells about research he did uh, with thousands of uh, Christ followers in churches and he looked uh, at uh, five years of church records and he asked the church leaders to go back and identify which of those church people just attended worship and which ones attended worship and also got in a community group. He said the results were unbelievable. They found that people that were, came to worship and also were in a community group were five times more likely to still be in the church five years later. People that were in a community group as well as worship were 83% more likely to still be involved following Christ in that church. Those who only attended worship there was only 16% chance that they would still be there five years later. Rainer says, of all the studies he's done, this one was the most astounding and amazing. So do you see how important it is to be part of a community group and not be solo to help you to be salt and light? All right, fourth observation, just mention it quickly. Influential Christ followers give the glory to God. Notice as we shine our light, it's not an ostentatious shining that focuses on us. Jesus says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's the light they will praise, not the lamp that bears it. It's the Father in heaven, not the children who represent him. When we're doing our job, it is hardly noticed. It's God who gets the glory. It's the same with salt. You go to a restaurant and order a steak. And you put some salt on it. You don't emerge from that restaurant later and say, Wow, that was great salt. <laughs> I mean, come on, that'd be ridiculous. So the church is largely unseen when it's doing its work. Christ followers are the most influential people in the world. Five years before his death, Martin Luther King was asked to speak at a rally of 250,000 people. He was the last speaker of the day. That's always a difficult assignment. You're supposed to be the inspirational speaker that sends people out. But people are tired. They're worn out. And so he puzzled over what he should say and he... He wrote down, you know, some notes and, and then he changed it and he just, he worked on it time and again and finally he got there with his full text and he started to give his speech and kind of struggled. And somebody in the crowd said, Martin, tell them the dream. And he fumbled along a little further and finally he set his notes aside and he told them about the dream. Vision starts with a dream. Five years later, Martin Luther King gave his final speech in Memphis. He didn't know at the time it would be his last speech. The next day, an assassin cut him down. 
In his final words, he says, My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. To make a difference in Portland this year, it starts with a dream that we can make a difference. Jesus says we can make a difference because we are salt and light. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your affirmation to us that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Maybe we came here today discouraged by things going on and feeling like we can't make any difference. Thank you for the encouragement as we go out that we can make a difference. I want to give you a moment to talk to God. Tell him what you heard Jesus say today. Maybe thank him that you are salt and light and tell him you really want to be salty and light bearing for him. If you've never committed your life to Christ, you could do it right now and say, Jesus, I, I know enough to know I believe in you, that you're the son of God and you were raised from the dead. I commit my life to you. Come into my life. I'll give you some time to pray. Every head bowed, you pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you call us the salt of the earth, preservative of what's good in this world and the light of the world, what you called yourself. Wow. We go from here with a new, new hope and encouragement that we can make a difference wherever we go. Thank you in Jesus' name we pray.